290. 290. Let's sing all three verses. Let's sing. I love thy kingdom, Lord, the house of thine abode, the church, our blessed Redeemer, save with his own precious blood. I love thy church, O God, her walls before thee stand, dear as the apple of thine eye, and graven on thy hand. For her my tears shall fall, Six hundred and thirty two. Six, three, two. Six hundred and thirty two. We'll sing the first and last verse, and then we will stand for the opening prayer. Of one the Lord has made the race, through one has come the fall. Where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all, the gospel is for all. Where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. Receive ye freely, freely give from every land they call. Unless they hear, they cannot live. The gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all. The gospel is for all. Where sin has gone, must go is grace. The gospel is for all. Please stand for the opening prayer. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this opportunity that we have together again this Lord's day in thy name to hear thy word proclaimed. Father, we're thankful for each one that is here tonight. Pray, Father, that you'll be with us, that we can put uh, all the worldly outside thoughts away and concentrate on the things that are said tonight. Pray that you'll be Brother Troy as he brings the lesson to us, Father. Pray that we'll take the things that said to help us go through the week. Father, we're mindful of the sick that was mentioned here today. Pray that you'll be with them. If it be thy will, they'll be restored to a better portion of health. Father, we're mindful of those who have lost loved ones. Pray that you'll be with their families and their friends through this time, in this time of sorrow, Father. Lord, uh, again, we're so thankful for the young men from Memphis School of Preaching that came to be with us last week. We're thankful for the attitude they had, and we're thankful for the blessings we received from them, and we're thankful for the sermons that they taught. Father, pray that you not only be with them, but be with all the young men the world over. 
that have made the choice and the dedication to study thy word further and to become preachers in thy kingdom. Father, pray that you'll give them many years of service, of fruitful service. Father, we pray that you'll be with us now as we continue our worship. Watch over us, guide, guard, direct us. Forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Remain standing. Number 226 will be the song before the lesson, but you'll need to mark the invitation song of number 346. 346. Song of invitation. Three, four, six. Two twenty six is what we'll sing now. Two, two, six. <clears throat> After we sing the song, Brother Troy will bring the lesson. We'll sing the first, second, and final verse. First, second, and last. <clears throat> Let's sing. Oh Lord my God, when I am awesome. Favorite songs that we would 
always sing at Maywood Christian Camp, especially at night on the ball field, looking up into the sky and seeing the stars and listening to the crickets and uh, the noises of the night. And we used to sit and sing that song, How Great Thou Art, was one of the songs that he loved to sing at Maywood Christian Camp. It's good to see you tonight. It's good to have you. If you're visiting with us, uh, please fill out a visitor's card and leave it on the pew so we'll have a record of your being with us this evening. We're going to continue our study that we begin this morning. We were talking about seven things God doesn't know. We talked about his omnipotence, uh, the fact that he's all-powerful. We talked about the fact that he's omnipresent. He's always everywhere at the same time. He sees everything we do. He's all-seeing. He's omniscient. He's all-wise. He's all-knowing there. God being all-wise and all-knowing by the title that we have, Seven Things God Doesn't Know, does not reflect upon God himself other than the fact that God is a loving God who loves each and every one of us. Now this morning we begin with our, our study by talking about the fact that God doesn't know one responsible person that is sinless. We have all sinned, come short of the glory of God, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. We talked about the fact that God doesn't know one sinner that he does not love and want to save. Uh, God has always put his love for each and every one of us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the fact is, God is not willing that any should perish. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. We talked about the fact that God doesn't know one sinner from whom Christ did not die. We know that under Calvinism and the idea of the limited atonement, they teach that on, Christ died only for the saved. Well, to a certain extent, that is true. But Christ died for all of mankind. And God is willing to save any and all of mankind. If only they will adhere to the conditions that he lays down as far as salvation is concerned. In that sense, God, had, Jesus died for all of mankind. It is true that only a few are going to be obedient to the gospel. Not everyone is going to obey, do the things that God requires as far as salvation is concerned. We looked at Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, the broad and the narrow way, the many and the few that go in thereat. Fourth of all, we talked about the fact that God doesn't know one responsible person going to heaven who is not first saved here on earth. Everyone that is going to be in that place called heaven is going to take care of that before they ever leave this earth. There is the idea of premillennialism and in that teaching they teach that one day when Jesus comes the second time that he is going to establish his kingdom. He was not able to establish his kingdom while he was here. He set up the church as a temporary state <clears throat> but when he comes the second time he will establish his kingdom. There will be a thousand year reign by which those who were not ready when he come, when he came would be able to prepare themselves to be able to go to heaven at the end of that thousand years reign. Well, as I said, that's premillennialism and uh, ism means false. It is not true. It's not taught in the Bible. The Bible teaches us that once life is over with here on this earth, it is done. Our fate is sealed. We're not going to have a second chance. We're not going to get another turn. It's over. It's sealed, just like it was with the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man enjoyed life sumptuously while here upon earth. But in the eternity, in the Hadean realm, he did not fare so well. As a matter of fact, he wished that Lazarus would come dip his finger in water and cool his tongue because the Bible says, I am tormented in this place. He was not where he wanted to be at that time. But the fact is, God loves all of mankind. Fifth of all tonight, as we continue our study, we're going to see that God doesn't know one saved person out of Christ. Everyone that is going to be saved is in Christ. As a matter of fact, if you would, take our Bibles and let's look together. We look at a few passages. First of all, let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 
Let's look at verse 10. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Where is salvation? Salvation is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. If I'm going to make it to heaven, it's going to be because I am one who is in Christ. I have been born into the Lord's church. I have been born into the kingdom of Christ. Take your Bible and turn back to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 7. In whom, speaking of Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Our salvation is only in Christ Jesus. Those outside of Christ are condemned. Notice Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Paul says, Therefore, uh, there is therefore now no condemnation, notice, to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now, if there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, what kind of conclusion can we draw from that statement? Those who are not in Christ Jesus must be in condemnation. Because he says, Therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If I am in Christ, then I am doing what God would have me to do. I have obeyed the gospel. But those outside of Christ, those who have not rendered themselves to the obedience of the gospel, are lost. They are in condemnation, per se. To get into Christ, how do we get into Christ? That may be a question we need to answer. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 3, beginning. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, how do we get into Christ? According to Paul in Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, we are baptized into Jesus Christ. Notice if you turn over a little further in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You know, a lot of people read verse 26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And as far as they go, they never look at verse 27. See, we're saved by faith. That's not what he says. He says we're saved by faith in obedience. Verse 27, For as many of you have been baptized into Christ. How does one get into Christ? Through baptism. It's the only one, only one, only one way to get into the church. It is to be baptized. Here's a syllogism for you. If you were having a debate or if you were trying to do it by logic, salvation is in Christ. Second of all, to get into Christ, we get there through baptism. Therefore, baptism is essential to salvation. So a lot of people in the world today would argue with us and say baptism has absolutely nothing to do with one's salvation. Well, my dear friends, where in the world do you get forgiveness of sins? <laughs> If you're not baptized in order to have your sins washed away, where does one get rid of his sins? Praying a prayer to Jesus is not what is taught in the book of Acts. Every conversion that we have there, those that obeyed the Lord and obeyed the gospel did it by being baptized into Christ there. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, Peter says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Peter says baptism saves. It saves because it takes away our sin. It saves because it's in that watery grave of baptism we come in contact with the blood of Christ. It is actually the blood of Christ that saves. But where do I come in contact with the blood of Christ? It's in the watery grave of baptism. When I am baptized, I leave my sins in that grave. I arise as a new creature. 
Second, ten, or Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 talks about those who are new creatures as a result of obedience to the gospel of Christ. Now, one cannot be saved outside the church. The same thing that puts us into Christ also puts us into his spiritual body, the church. Note with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul had given some of the uh, different gifts, but also but in verse 13, before he does that, notice what he says. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into the one spirit. For by the one spirit are we all baptized into the one body. The church and the kingdom and the body are one and the same. If I have been baptized into Christ, I have been baptized into the body, that is the church. The church consists of different individuals as far as the kingdom is concerned and the church is concerned. We all make up the body of Christ. And that's the argument in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, for the body is not one member but many. And he talks about how that one cannot say that they're not needful and one should not be looked down upon because it may not have uh, the faculties and, and of certain things. And he uses the body itself as an example, such as the heart, the kidneys, the inner being of mankind. And they're not pretty to look at. You know, I've never actually seen a heart beating other than, in fact, on TV and the movies and stuff like that. I've never been in surgery where it was took place, but I know it's not very pretty. I know our kidneys are not very pretty. I know our liver's not very pretty, but, friends, you won't live without it. You get rid of either one of them, and you're going to die soon. You're not going to live very long without your liver, without your kidney, without your heart, without your brain. You take them out, you're done you are done Tom Turkey, as one would say. You're just not going to live very long. Well, when it comes to the church, we have to realize there is but one body, the church, the kingdom. One church is what Jesus uh, said that he would build in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 upon the confession that Peter had made that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we have the one body, the one church, and when I'm baptized, I am baptized into the kingdom, into the body that is the church. Now in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 23, we observe that Jesus is the head of the church, the Savior of the body. And as you've already seen in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22 and 23, the obvious indication is that He's not the Savior of those outside the body. Jesus is the Savior of the body. The head. He is the head of the church. He's the Savior of the body. Those who are outside the church, those who are outside the body, those who are outside the kingdom, He is not going to save because He didn't shed His blood for them. Now, is it the fact that one who is outside the kingdom, outside the church, outside the body, is it possible for them to get into the body? Well, of course it is. Yes, most assuredly, they can get into the body but you have to do it the way God says do it. And the only way that one can get into the body, as we've already seen, the only way one can get into Christ is to be baptized into Christ for the remission of his sins. Now, two questions. First of all, does Jesus save folks in the church or out of the church? Which one does the Bible teach? Does Jesus save all of mankind? Does he have universal salvation? No matter what you do, you just believe what you want to, Jesus is going to save you? Absolutely not. Does he save those who are in his kingdom? Well, of course he does. Because why? He died for them. He shed his blood for them. What about those outside the kingdom of Christ? Jesus is not going to save them in the judgment day if they remain in that condition. One must be in Christ in order to have salvation. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And so we see that one must be in Christ. There is the importance, the necessity of the church. One must be in it in order to go to heaven. Sixth of all, God doesn't know one person 
who will escape the judgment. God does not know one person who will escape the judgment. Remember this morning we talked about Jesus as being the Savior of the body? Jesus is the Savior of the body right now. But we also noted on the other hand that come when life is over on earth for us, Jesus becomes the judge of all. He's the Savior now. He'll be a judge later. And so which one of Jesus do you want? <laughs> of course, we want, we want the Savior. We want Jesus to save us. Are we willing to do what Jesus would tell us to do? Because if we're willing to do what Jesus tells us to do, then most assuredly he can be a righteous judge and we will not fear him. But friends, let me tell you, if you're not right with Christ and you're not, you haven't obeyed the gospel, then most assuredly you have a great fear of death. Death is going to happen to each and every one of us. So one day we're going to stand in the judgment to give an account of the things we've done in our body, whether it be good or bad, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. But in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, and it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Notice, Jesus the Savior today, Jesus the judge tomorrow. And so we need to think about that. There is not one person who will escape the judgment. Everybody's going to be gathered there. We're all going to give an account of the things that we've done, whether they're good or whether they're bad. You know, we make appointments all the time. We make dental appointments, we make doctor's appointments, we make appointments to do this, that, and the other. And we know that those are conditional. We know that if something comes up, especially the dentist, and we have something that stands in our way, or we feel there's something more important than going to the dentist, but I can assure you if we have a toothache, we're going to the dentist no matter what's happening over here. But sometimes we can break those appointments. We can change the appointment. We do that with a doctor if we so choose. But friends, here's an appointment that we're all going to keep. All of us are going to die. One day we're going to stand before Jesus who is going to be the judge according to Acts chapter 17, 30 and 31. He is going to judge us in that day. John 12, 48, the words that I have spoken, the same shall judge you in the last day. So we know that one day we're going to stand in the judgment and there is inescapable. I can't get out of it. So which way do I want to find myself? What condition do I want to find myself in when that day comes? Now we know that's going to happen. Romans 14, 10 says, We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Christ is going to be the great judge. As we talked this morning, He is going to be able to look into our hearts. He's going to know the ins and the outs, the buts and the ifs, and everything else pertaining to our lives because He is a righteous judge. He is one that can read the hearts of men and know our every move. This is going to be a day of separation. A day of separation will be for all eternity. You know, we may separate from our loved ones for a period of time, knowing and hoping that one day down the road, a week or two, a year or whatever, we'll get back together. But friends, when this day comes, there's going to be a great separation between those on the right hand, those on the left hand, and believe you me, it's going to be for an eternity. There will never ever be the opportunity where the ones on the left hand can go where those are on the right hand. They may want to. That's what the rich man wanted to do. He saw Lazarus up in Abraham's bosom and he wanted to be there. But he couldn't because there's a great gulf fixed. He wanted Lazarus to come down and dip his finger in cold water and cool his tongue because he says, I am tormented in this place. There's going to be a great separation in that day. Not only a great separation, but here's, the, here's an important point. It's also going to be a day of reward. A day of reward. Now, we all like rewards. Matter of fact, uh, most of us, if we have a credit card, we like to have a credit card that gives us rewards. You know, whether no matter what it might be, whether it be dollars or cents or whether it be whatever, we like a rewards card. I mean, you know, nowadays it seems as though uh, you go to Kroger, you get a rewards card. You go to Staples, you get a rewards card. You go wherever you buy and spend, you get a rewards card. They want to reward you for giving them business. In this day, we're going to receive a reward. Some of those rewards are going to be good. Some of them are not going to be so good. 
Because see, if we make it to heaven, that will be our reward for having done good. If we don't make it to heaven and we end up in hell, that's our reward too for not having lived the Christian life. You see, this reward could be good, this reward could be bad, depending upon the life that we've lived while here upon earth. Not only is it going to be a day of separation, a day of reward, but it's going to be a day, a great day, or a sad day. We sing a song, Oh, how sad to face the judgment, unprepared to meet thy God. Are we prepared to meet our God? Are we ready for Jesus? Should he come at any time? You remember Felix in Acts chapter 24, verse 25? He was frightened. He was scared. That may be, very, may be us on the judgment day. There's a story told, and this is a true story, of a town, Johnson Town, Pennsylvania. And the uh, Corps of Engineers came in. Johnson Town was located below a dam, uh, above, above them, in which the engineers came to check that dam to make sure that the dam was safe and the people in the town were not in harm. So when they checked it, they found out that the dam was not in good shape and that they warned the people that they ought to leave the town of Johnson, Johnsville. And they didn't. And they came back the following spring. They inspected the dam. And once again, they warned the people, you need to leave because the dam is not in good repair. And once again, they came a third time. And they warned the people. And they replied to them, try to scare us off. Fifteen days later, a boy came riding on his horse as hard as he could go, saying, the dam is broke, run for your life. 3,700 people lost their lives. What was the problem? They didn't see the urgency. They didn't see the urgency there. God doesn't know one person who will escape the judgment. Finally, God doesn't know a better time for you to be saved than right now. God doesn't know a better time for you to be saved than right now. The Bible doesn't speak in terms of yesterdays and tomorrows. The Bible speaks of the now. That's all we're guaranteed is the now, what we have right now. I know each one of us plan to get up in the morning, go through the same routine we have for all of our lives. Get up and shave, get up and take a shower, get up and get dressed, go to work, get our coffee, stop it wherever we stop to get our biscuit or whatever we do in every morning. We do it every morning. It's a routine. We do it every day. But you know, one day it's going to cease to be. If you go by there and you go to Starbucks every morning, once you pass, Starbucks is history. You won't be going to Starbucks anymore. You won't be going to Hardy's anymore. You won't be going anywhere anymore because life is over with. You see, the Bible only speaks of today. Yesterday is gone forever. Tomorrow may never come. So all we have right now. Now, here is, here is, it makes it urgent. It makes it urgent because the future is uncertain. James tells us in James 4, 13 through 15, that we don't need to talk about tomorrow. All we have is today. And when you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, Paul says the day of salvation is now, now is the day of salvation. Now, when we stand on the judgment day, we have to realize that we're going to be facing God. And God is going to take into account all the things that we have done here upon this earth. And forget those. But God is also going to take into account how many times the invitation you heard extended. And you never, ever seem to care to make things right in your life. Now, how sad would it be? Stand in judgment, face God, having just heard the invitation the day before and didn't respond to it, knowing good and well if you died that you'd be lost, knowing good and well you had sin in your life but you didn't see fit to take care of it. How, how, why would one want to do that? Why would one sacrifice all that he or she has ever done for the Lord based upon the fact that they just didn't feel like they needed to walk the aisle for something they did, whether it be five years, ten years, twenty years ago that they've never repented of, or whether it was thirty minutes ago. 
we sing a song as the life of a flower, and it contains these words. True today we are here, but tomorrow may see just a grave in the veil and a memory of me. That's how, life, that's how short life is. Whether you realize it or not, one day your name will be upon a tombstone. It'll be in a graveyard that nobody ever visits except your own. Think about that. But you know, if your name is found written in the Lamb's Book of Life, You've got something to look forward to. You've got heaven to be a part of. This idea of being right and obeying the gospel right now is urgent because death is sure. Life is not certain, but death is sure. We see people dying every day. It is urgent because we don't have a lease on life. God didn't sign a contract with us saying we had X amount of days or X amount of years to live upon this earth. And so that can be withdrawn at any given time because we don't have a lease on it. It's urgent because the time of Christ's coming is unknown. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if some preacher somewhere, somehow could tell us when Jesus was coming and we could all be ready, prepared. But nobody knows that time. Nobody knows that place. Therefore, we have to be prepared at all times. Life is urgent because the length of eternity makes this matter urgent. How long is eternity? Your finite mind cannot comprehend it. Your finite mind. We have an infinite God. He has always been. He will always be. He has no beginning. He has no end. But you and I are not like that, friends. We had a beginning, and we'll have an end here on this earth. And if we're found faithful, we will have eternity in heaven with God. Someone has tried to, and we hear all kind of illustrations trying to illustrate how long eternity is, but I've, I've, I read one that I've never read before. Suppose the, the earth, the size of the earth is 25,000 miles around, and suppose there was a steel ball. It was a steel ball, the earth was. And he had a hummingbird that could fly from the earth to a star, the nearest star, and it would take him two million years to get there and back. And as he came back, his wings would touch that steel ball, and he would return and go back to the star, come back another two million years. His wings would touch the ball, the steel ball, and he'd go back. And the question is proposed, how long do you think it would take that hummingbird to get rid of this steel ball? My mind can't grasp it. We say, there ain't no way a hummingbird could live that long to flap his wings on a steel ball 25,000 miles around in circumference and take it away eventually given enough time. Well, that's either heaven or hell, one of the two places. God doesn't know a better time for you to be saved than right now. If you're not a member of the Lord's church, you can do something about it. You can be added to the church. You can become a member of the kingdom by being baptized for the remission of your sins. If you are a member of the Lord's church and you've gone astray, and you know, we all go astray. If we all sin, come short of the glory of God. We're not perfect. We're human beings. And we are going to fail from time to time. And, and hopefully we learn from our mistakes and we get better at it. And that's what Christianity is all about, getting better at what we do, trying to live that example, be perfect like Christ, although we never will achieve it, but that's the goal, that's our aim, that's our aspiration, and that's what God expects of us. One day, even with all of our flaws, if we've done what God would have us to do while here upon this earth, He is going to consider us perfect. Not that we've not sinned, but because we've done what He said to do. 
He is the one that is going to make the judgment call and the judgment. And thank goodness I'm glad God is going to be our judge. But if you're here and you need to respond, we want to encourage you to do so. As together we stand and say.